Thank you, thank you very much for this uh, for this invitation. It's been a pleasure to be here in this uh, in this wonderful workshop. Um, I'm going to talk about the dimer model. Um, so Beatrice gave a wonderful lecture series um, on on this model. So you'll you'll probably know all about the sort of the basic stuff I'm going to say in the first few slides. I do apologize for that. Um, however, you will see uh, later that the approach we take is slightly different from. Uh, uh, from the approach which Beatrice took in his uh, in her uh, uh, lecture series, um, and it's it's more probabilistic in some sense, I and mean, that's my point of view. So, uh, this is joint work with Nathaniel Berestiki and uh, Benoit Lelier. Uh, Benoit is now in Paris, and uh, um, he will be in IHP uh, next week. So, if you want to talk to him, uh, you can do it there. Uh, but this work was done when he was in Cambridge, so it's really a Cambridge production. Okay, so. So the dimer model, let me remind you, it's, uh, so I'm going to work with uh, bipartite planar graphs because I want to work with the height function. Um, and uh, a dimer model is a perfect matching. So I will match uh, the black vertices with the white vertices such that every black vertex is matched with exactly one white vertex. Okay, so that's a, a dimer, that's what I call a dimer configuration. And uh, of primary interest would be the hexagonal lattice and uh, as Beatrice uh, explained very well in her lecture note, lecture uh, this week, that uh, for a dimer uh, configuration, you can uh, associate a tiling of the plane. Um, so here I've drawn uh, this tiling. This is sometimes called the lozenge tiling also by some people because this rhombi look like lozenges. Um, and on the hexagonal lattice, there are three types of lozenges. Uh, so I've colored them green, blue, and, and, and red. Um, and the way I like to, uh, and many people like to look at this picture is uh, think of this, uh, this uh, tiling as a stack of cubes in the corner of a room. Um, and once you, once you see it like that, it's, it's, uh, it's very easy to see it, to see it like that in this picture. Uh, it de once, you, once you view it as a stack of cubes, it describes for you a surface uh, in three dimensions. Um, and the boundary of this, of this surface would describe a curve in three dimensions. And I want to know the large-scale statistics of this surface. Okay? So um, as Beatrice also explained, that you can, uh, if you have a bipartite graph, you can associate a height function. There are various ways to uh, define this height function. Uh, Beatrice explained the way uh, Thurston uh, defined this height function. Um, but here, uh, it, it, it's, it's, uh, in this picture, it's, it's probably a bit uh, probably more visual uh, maybe I don't know. It's uh, so you just look at the the height of the cube from the from the floor, uh, and uh, that that defines you a function uh, on the on the cubes, and uh, the height is basically basically this number. So it's a uh, it's a bunch of integers, and this height function encodes uh, encodes this surface in some sense. So I want to know what's the so I will now take a a random surface that will give you a random function which is a uh, uh, a function uh, defined um, on the on the on the plane, and this random function. I want to know uh, the la large scale statistics. I want to uh, understand the the law of large number and uh, sort of the fluctuations around its mean and things like that. So those are the basic questions. Okay. So um, any first course in probability, you will uh, you will come across this law of large numbers. You will have a bunch of random variables, and you would want to know the the mean behavior. That's uh, and in this case, when you have a random surface, it will be a mean surface. And then you learn about the central limit theorem, uh, which is the fluctuations around this mean. Oops. The fluctuations around this mean. Um, and here also you can ask the same question. Once you know what the mean surface is, which will be some function from uh, R2 to R, uh, you would want to know what's the fluctuation. And is this fluctuation universal? So that's what central limit theorem tells you that uh, given any sort of nice sequence of random variables, if you look at the fluctuations around the mean, it's a universal random variable, which is the normal random variable, or the, Brown and, or the Brownian motion if you uh, parameterize it with time. Here you would want to know what's the, is there some sort of universality? So that's, so um, 
So the topic of this talk is, is the second point, the fluctuation. And I want to convince you that there is some kind of universality there. OK. Uh, so here's some, some nice pictures by, by Rick Kenyon. So here, uh, the boundary curve is a hexagon. And I'm looking at a uniform lozenge styling. And, it's, uh, and I find this picture very, very interesting, because uh, you can see that the boundary uh, sort of determines uh, uh, not only the, the mean surface, but also how the fluctuation behaves uh, if you look at certain points inside. So if you are very well inside, uh, so, so you can see it, it's, uh, the boundary, there's sort of a well-defined circle which inscribes uh, the hexagon. And if you're inside this, this circle, it seems to be more random than near the corners. And this is called the Arctic circle phenomena. Um, and it, it's sometimes uh, it's, it's, it's um, described like this, that near the corner, the lozenges are frozen. It's very unlikely. For example, if you're near the yellow corner, it's very unlikely to have a, um, a purple lozenge, say. But inside, uh, things are more random, and it's called the liquid region. And the fluctuations near the liquid region is supposed to behave like a universal random function. So I'm kind of interested in the, in the, in the things inside. And the boundary conditions are also going to be very special for me, because for dimers, uh, the boundary conditions play a very crucial role. And, and any dimer model is very sensitive to, uh, to, the boundary, to the boundary curve. So if you change the boundary curve even a little bit, microscopically, it will change uh, the large scale structure uh, a lot. OK, so here's another uh, picture. This, uh, all these things were uh, studied by Kenya Nokunkov and Sheffield. Uh, here you can see a different um, sort of boundary curve inside which you have the liquid region. OK, so what's this, uh, so what's this universal function? Um, so in, in one dimension, you have, this, uh, you have the Brownian motion. And you know that the marginals are normal random variables. And you have some kind of a correlation uh, between, the, between, the, between the variables in one dimension. Here also, it's the same thing, except that it's uh, a slightly more complicated, not much, slightly more complicated, that the function is not really a function. So it's uh, inside quotes, uh, this random function. But the marginals are still uh, Gaussian. However, the covariances between two points, so for every point in my domain, I have a random variable, hx, uh, where x is the, is the point in the complex plane. And the covariance is given by uh, log of the distance between x and y. So as, you, as you, you can see that if x and y comes close to each other, this log will, will diverge. So the variance is actually infinite. So that's why it's not a, not a function. However, log is a, is a nice function. So you can um, integrate uh, log against test function. It will still define a well-defined uh, random variable. So if you integrate this random function against any test function, it, you get a uh, nice and concrete normal random variable with the variance given by, uh, by this formula. OK, so why, why the GFF is the right thing to look at? Uh, one major property which makes the GFF so nice is that it's conformally invariant. So if you take a GFF in a certain domain, conformally map it to another uh, domain, that gives you another GFF in the, in the image. So that's, uh, and all these, um, Universal properties are supposed to be conformally invariant in two dimensions, so that's why this this uh, should be the right fit. Okay, so here's a simulation of the GFF due to Scott Sheville. You can see it's it's very rough. It's a, it's a discrete approximation. Um, however, um, uh, the the peaks are going to sort of blow up as you as you let the approximation um, go to zero. Okay. So that's a kind of the universal field. And what we want to do is to show, take, a di take a dimer model uh, and want to show that the fluctuations um, are supposed to behave like this in the, in the limit. OK, so here's a, a bit of history. Uh, the first uh, work uh, gives you the sort of the law of large number. And it's, it's kind of very well known what, what, what it should look like. Um, however, the fluctuations are, 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 are less understood. And here's a bunch of uh, work who, who deals with these uh, fluctuations on various types of models and various types of boundary conditions. Um, um, so so all, these, all this work, I should point out that they took this, um, um, this method of uh, using the Castellan matrix to compute the, to co the covariances. 
so it's a uh, uh, but but uh, you will see that the, the approach we take is, is slightly different. It's, it's not using the Castelli matrix at all in, uh, in the proof. So perhaps it, it, can, uh, it can help with some other problems which are difficult to solve with using this approach. That's the, that's the hope. Okay, so, so, what's, uh, one, so what's the main theorem? It's one of the applications of a more general theorem I'm going to tell you a bit later. So the main theorem is the following. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, the boundary conditions for dimer is, is very important. If you change the boundary conditions, uh, the large scale behavior changes changes very rapidly. So the so the important thing is to is to make sure you understand what the boundary conditions we are taking here. So the boundary, remember, is a curve in three dimension, and we want our boundary curve to be close to some some plane. And in that case, there is no frozen region, and everything um, everything is liquid. So here, the boundary curve is close to some plane in three dimensions, and inside, everywhere, you should expect a GFF-like behavior. Okay, so let me explain a bit more. So for example, this is a non-planar boundary, uh, the hexagon, because you saw there was a frozen region in the hexagon, and you can convince yourself that the boundary curve is, is, is not planar, because uh, the three parts of the boundary lie in the three different um, uh, three different planes, the yz plane, the xy, and the xz plane. So it's very far away from being planar. And that's not uh, the boundary condition we're looking at here. The condition we're looking at is the following. So you take a, a, a discrete domain in, in, in the complex, uh, a continuum domain, I'm sorry, in the complex plane, um, which is my floor here. And I'm going to approximate this domain by a sequence of discrete uh, curves which approximate a plane in 3D. And also, and when you project it down, it also approximates the, the continuum domain. Okay. So the slope of the plane that you take plays, a, plays an important role here, because the, the methods uh, by which you prove things changes rapidly if you change the slope. And the slope uh, uh, and, 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 the, and the curves being close to the slope in three dimension uh, 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 makes the makes the even even the loss slightly different of the limit. So that's uh, so 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 the slope. Uh, uh, I mean, f proving the thing for various different slopes are are not the same. For example, for rational slopes, the proof is like the 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 picture you see in the discrete. It might be slightly different from irrational slopes and so on. So the slope uh, being uh, everything is is the new new thing in in our theorem. Is the is the setup. Is the setup clear? Any question about the about the setup? Okay, so it's uh, it's slightly more complicated. So I wanted to make sure this this part is okay. Um, so okay, uh, again, you can define the height function for the dimer configuration. So so remember, we have finally a dimer configuration on the uh, on the floor with that particular boundary condition, and uh, we want to uh, look at the height function. And for the height function, again, we can uh, look at a very small cubes of size delta and let delta go to zero. Um, and then we want to know the fluctuation around the, around the mean surface. Okay? So that's, uh, that's the theorem. So you take the honeycomb lattice, you take cubes of size delta, and then for all slope, I can find an approximating sequence of domains like that, which approximates the slope and the projection onto the floor. Um, then if you... Um, subtract the expectation of the height function. There is a mysterious L here. I'm going to tell you about it a bit later. Ignore it for, for now. So the height function, when you subtract the expectation, uh, uh, it, can, it converges to some square root two times, times a GFF. So there, the square root two is, uh, uh, has an interpretation. I, can, I, I will tell you later in the talk. However, let me just tell you now, uh, what is this L? So this L is an explicit linear map which depends on the slope. So in the end, you get a limit which is a linear function, a linear map of the GFF. So it's not really, a, not exactly a GFF, but okay, it's, a, it's, still, it's still very, it's still close enough. It's, it's good enough for us. And uh, there is a rescaling by delta. So this, this is a bit uh, misleading because actually we are not uh, scaling at all because uh, remember, we uh, scaled the cube sizes to be delta, and then we are unscaling by delta. So basically, there's no scaling. So this is where it's, it's slightly different from the central limit theorem. In the central limit theorem, if you take n random variables, you have to rescale by square root n. But here, 
uh, there is uh, no scaling. When you subtract the mean, uh, your fluctuations are the GFF. So even if you have some terms in your, in your function, which is big O of one, you have, to, you have to take care of that. You cannot throw away big O of one terms. Okay. Um, okay, so this uh, proof will go without Castellan matrices. I will try to convince you of the proof in the, in the time I have. And okay, so in what sense, uh, okay, I told you about a specific model. So in what sense we are uh, trying to say it's, it may be a way towards universality. Uh, I will try to explain you in the proof, but let me uh, say uh, a bit why is it universal? Because uh, what we say in the end is that if you, you take some certain associated graph, and if the, send, uh, if the random walk converges to Brownian motion on that associated graph, then we have a convergence of the height function to, to the GFF. So in this sense, uh, so this is basic, so this is the, so this won't make sense at the moment, but uh, because I haven't told you how you connect this associated graph and the central limit theorem on, of random walk with the height function, I haven't told you anything, but that, in that sense, this is universal. Um, and it also, for example, uh, recovers the work of Kenyon and Lee. So Lee worked on isoradial graphs, and on isoradial graphs, it's, uh, it's very easy to prove central limit theorem. So the height function uh, convergence uh, of the work of Zhang Yang Li, would, it would be recovered uh, by this method. Also, the work of Kenyon on domino tilings uh, using the central limit theorem on the square lattice, you can recover, this, uh, recover the result. And we hope there are some possible future application. I will try to convince you in the end about uh, some uh, more applications on, on dimers on some more complicated topology uh, given the time. Uh, so that's one possible future application. Another one is uh, extension to this thing to non-planar boundaries. So it's, uh, it's, it's slightly more complicated because the, the central limit theorem uh, that we use is, uh, is, is not always, always true when you have a non-planar boundary, so it needs more work. However, we hope that these methods uh, might, might, uh, might give you uh, some non-trivial results. And the last one is, is even more into the future. It's, uh, it's probably more sci science fiction, is uh, when you have some, put some interaction in the, dimer, in the dimer model. So don't take a uniform dimer model. Uh, you introduce some interaction for, uh, let's say you put, uh, you put give an extra, uh, uh, give some extra weight to dimers which are parallel to each other, let's say in the square lattice. Okay, so that's putting some interaction. And then if you do that, the sort of the exact solvability is, is no longer true. Uh, but still, uh, you should have a GFF fluctuation, but you should replace the square root two by something else. So that's, uh, that's the belief. And uh, I will try to tell you a bit in the, at the end of the talk if I have, uh, if I have time. Okay, so. So what's, uh, what's, uh, what's our approach without Castellin matrices? Um, so this is the simplest uh, version of this, of this connection, and that's, uh, that goes back to the work of Temperley, and it's called Temperley's bijection. So this bijection works for a very specific type of boundary conditions called Temperleyan boundary conditions. It doesn't work if you don't have Temperleyan boundary condition. However, it's, uh, it's most visual here, so I will try to explain it uh, in this, in this uh, in this scenario. So here's a temporal lane domain. I have drawn the height functions in the, in the faces. So remember, you can draw height functions on any uh, bipartite planar graph using these flows, et cetera. I haven't told you anything about that, but uh, you believe me for now that there is a height function like that. And I'm going to associate the height function with the winding of the branches of a pair of spanning trees. Okay, so that's a, that's a lot of words. So let me give you a picture or this is what I just said. So I will associate the winding of a uniform spanning tree on a certain graph with the dimer height function. Okay, so what is a spanning tree? Let me quickly explain. It's, uh, it's very simple. You take a graph, okay, and you take a tree uh, consisting of all the vertices in the graph, like this, uh, and a uniform spanning tree is very simple. You look at all possible spanning trees and pick one at random. Okay, so here, what's the connection? This is the connection. Uh, so I have two trees, uh, one purple tree and one green tree. Um, and these two, uh, two trees, um, okay, so it's, it's uh, not a single spanning tree of this whole graph, but let me, let me explain maybe from the dimer model. So what I do is, uh, is the following. 
uh, I will, uh, so I have removed one corner. So that gives me a kind of a direction. And I will extend the dimer from every black to the white vertex one more edge. So for example, so I have this, uh, this pointer here. Let's look at, for example, this one, this dimer. So uh, what I will do is I will uh, extend the dimer from the black towards the white towards this corner. And I have done it for every, every dimer. OK? And that, that will give me this picture. Uh, so what is this? Uh, so you might complain that you see a big cycle. Why, why is it a tree? This is uh, the purple tree is the, is the wire tree. It's called the wire tree. It's, it's, it's a spanning tree of the dual. It's a spanning tree of the graph where you wire the boundary vertices into a single vertex. And the dual of this pink wire tree gives you the green tree, which is the free tree. OK? Anyway, so you get a pair of these spanning trees. The spanning trees are not exactly of this graph, but uh, twice, twice Z2. OK? But in the end, it doesn't matter too, matter too much. But the important point is that um, the winding of the branches, so let's take the purple tree. The winding of the branches of the purple tree gives you the height function. So for example, if you, so the pointer is not working, sorry, so I have to use this manual method. Um, so if you go along this branch, uh, you can see that the winding is not changing much. It's fluctuating between, it's oscillating between one and two, so on average it's like 1.5, okay? Um, but as soon as you turn at the top of that branch, right, uh, right there, uh, there, you see it, it, it increases from one to, to three, uh, 1.5 to 2.5. And then you turn again, and you go from 2.5 to 3.5 on average. So, um, so from this, Eta Benjamini said that, well, that the winding is the height, the height function. So look at the, look at the winding. Okay, so if you take a uniform dimer configuration, it gives you a uniform spanning tree. And so the basic goal is to understand the, sorry, so the basic goal is to understand the winding of a uniform spanning tree, how it behaves in the scaling limit. Okay, so what happens in the hexagonal lattice? Hexagonal lattice is not a temporal lane domain. Okay, however, um, um, there is still this connection and it's more complicated than the one I described to you. Uh, and it won't shed any light on the later uh, rest of the proof. It's a combinatorial thing. So let me just quickly tell you what, uh, quickly sort of uh, give you the flavor. So you have a dimer model on the hexagonal lattice, um, and given a slope, you can get a certain graph called the, which is on the right hand side. It's called the T graph, for the reason that it's a union of segments, and the segments sort of meet each other in a T. Okay. And the, the, the crucial connection is that if you take a uniform spanning tree on the T graph, the winding gives you the height function. Okay, so it's an extension of this temporal and result for the hexagonal lattice. So these T graphs are, are, are very interesting. They are, uh, so, so if, if the slope is not rational, they are not periodic. Okay, so even proving central limit theorem is non-trivial. Um, however, the random walk is a martingale which is good news if you want to prove central limit theorem. Um, but still, you need to prove uh, uh, something about the variance, that it's, it's not, not so bad, et cetera. So luckily, Benoit Lallier did, uh, did exactly this uh, in, his, in one of his results in his PhD. So we don't have to worry about central limit theorem. Uh, so that's uh, kind of the starting point of why we started thinking about this. OK. Anyway, so we have central limit theorem. What's the connection with uniform spanning tree, et cetera? So that's what I'm going to explain to you now. Uh, let me quickly mention that this is not our observation. This was known from way before, and uh, people tried to think about it. So this is one uh, excerpt of what I just, may, what's the approach I just explained to you in a paper of Dubeda and Ghesari. Um, however, it was not clear how to implement it, so that's, uh, that's kind of the thing we do, this paper. Okay, so this is the, the main result. Uh, and the previous result would be a corollary of that using this T graph and the central limit theorem of Benoit Lelier. Um, so you take a domain um, uh, with rough boundaries also. So you can, you can, you can take locally connected boundaries. Um, and you look at the winding of the, you take a uniform spanning tree uh, on a discrete approximation, a well-chosen discrete approximation. Um, um, 
Uh, sorry, I apologize. So for this theorem, you don't need uh, any discrete approximation of, will, would work. Um, so you take a discrete approximation, and you, the winding of the spanning tree branches gives you, so for every point, um, there is a branch going to some mark point, and you look at the winding of that branch. That gives you a number. And this number, when you subtract the mean, converges to square root 2 times uh, Gaussian free field. Okay. So we need two conditions on the graph. One is that the central limit theorem holds. This, we believe, is, should be enough. However, for technical reasons, we need another condition, which is not too bad. It says that if you have a layer, long rectangle, there is a uniformly positive probability of crossing from the left to right. Okay? It's kind of a rousseau seymour welch uh, condition, if you're familiar with that word. Uh, notice that it doesn't follow from the central limit theorem, the second condition, because it tells you kind of the speed of the random walk converging to central limit theorem is, is, uh, is uniform over, the, over all pos positions of the graph, which is, uh, so this is something that's not clear for T graphs with irrational slopes, and we had to prove it separately for that, for the second condition. Any questions about the, about the main result? Okay, so okay, so why is uniform spanning tree such amenable to this sort of analysis? Because it was, it was known from the work of uh, Schramm and then Lola, Schramm, and Warner that the uniform spanning tree has a very nice scaling limit. It's something like a continuum tree. Uh, so I have to tell you in what sense you take the limit because a spanning tree, if you take the scaling limit, if you just look at the Hausdorff uh, metric, you just uh, get something space filling because uh, there's tree branches everywhere. However, you have to define some, some special kind of topology, to, uh, which is the Schramm topology, and you can make sense of a, a continuum tree in the limit. Uh, I won't go into the details because uh, of the lack of time, but I will show you a picture. And here it is. So it's a, it's a uniform spanning tree with wired boundary conditions on a square with 1,000 branches. As you can see, the branches are, are fractally, okay? So, um, so it's, it's non-trivial a priori to make sense of the winding of, of, rough, uh, of rough curves, okay? So, um, okay? Uh, so one thing I want you to notice here, okay, so what's the color coding? So the first probably uh, around 100 branches are red and the rest are blue. And the, and the main point is that um, uh, if, you, if you sample these 100 branches, the, the, the long branches are the red branches, and the, and the small branches are the blue branches. So if you want to, uh, if you have sampled the 100 branches, the rest of the branches are kind of small. So if you want to know the winding field, uh, looking at the first few is, is kind of enough. So there is a quantitative version of this, of this, uh, of this statement that's called the Schramm's lemma, and that's, uh, that makes uh, uniform spanning tree very nice to, to, uh, to deal with. Okay, the, among the, one of the many nice properties of uniform spanning tree, this is one of them which is, which is crucial here. Okay. Okay, and the branches of the uniform spanning tree are, not, are also not uh, abstract. They are uh, SLE two curves. So I, I also don't have time to go into SLE, but it's a one parameter family of curves satisfying conformal invariance and domain Markov property. And moreover, it's, it's not something very abstract. There is a concrete differential equation, a stochastic differential equation, by which you can uh, understand the evolution of the, of, the, of the SLE curve. So, and the winding of the SLE curve is somehow given by something called the driving function of the SLE curve, which evolves more or less like Brownian motion, as you would expect, uh, expect here. So I, I, I didn't tell you what you mean by winding, et cetera, but, um, but that, that's what we will make sense of this, make sense of in this, in this work. Okay, so that's, uh, that's SLE. Okay, winding. So, okay, so, uh, so this is a very simple observation. It, it should appear very simple to you, but that's kind, of, uh, one, that's kind of why all of this works, we think. So you take a smooth curve, okay? Uh, so how can you define the winding of the curve? So there are several uh, ways. So you can just go along the curve and look at how, what is the amount of turn that you do, okay? So this is, this is something we call the, the, the intrinsic winding. So put it mathematically, you just look at the tangents, uh, gamma prime t, and you look at how you uh, uh, change, change the angle as you go along the curve, and then you integrate, okay? So that's a, that's a very simple way. For this curve, I did this computation, which is perhaps wrong, but uh, let's assume it's right, it's, um, it's this number. 
it's, uh, it's minus 13 pi over two. Note that this is defined only for smooth curves because we are looking at the derivative. Okay. So what is wh what other way you can you can think about it? Uh, so imagine you are sitting on gamma one, which is one endpoint of the curve, and you look at how the curve turns seen from your point. Okay. So this is given by this this formula, and you want to take it continuously because you don't want to if you turn to pi you don't want to go back to zero. So you, when you turn 2 pi, you start counting again from 2 pi. So if you turn a lot, you will, you will end up with a large number. Okay? So, uh, so this uh, gives you another number. It's different from the one that you, that you got before. You can check it with some very simple examples. You will see that these numbers do not match at all. Um, however, this is more robust. You can define it for curves which is smooth near the endpoint. So if it's winding, uh, very viciously near the end point, you still have no meaning because it might just blow up to infinity. However, if it's, uh, imagine if it's a straight line near the end point where, from where you're looking at the curve, it still makes sense, even if the curve is rough outside the neighborhood. Okay? Okay? So we need to find a connection between the two. Um, okay, sorry. So you can, so you can also look at the, this thing from any other point uh, or the other endpoint, etc. It still all makes sense. Okay, so what's the connection? Um, so you can see that uh, I have uh, um, computed the topolo this topological winding. That's what we call it around gamma one and gamma zero. And 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 if I add them up, you will get the get the intrinsic winding. Okay. Okay. So that's uh, that's the lemma. Topological winding. If you sum them up, it's the it's the intrinsic winding for smooth curves. Okay. Um, okay. So what does this mean? This means that if you have a set of discrete curves uh, approximating a rough curve, which is smooth near the endpoints, then um, the intrinsic winding is equal to the sum of the topological winding. And the topological winding, if you um, take the limit, um, it, if it's smooth near the endpoints, uh, and if the curve converges, then the topological winding does converge. Okay? That means that the intrinsic winding uh, does converge here. In some sense. Okay, so we need to smoothen near the endpoints. That's what this, this screams to us, this lemma. Okay, so that's what we do. We take this, uh, so I've drawn five branches of the, of the uniform spanning tree. And um, uh, so I've smoothened it near the endpoints. And I have uh, this height function. Uh, I have, uh, so there's the winding of the red part and the winding of the blue part. The blue part is actually infinity, but the red part is something finite. Okay, so if I want the second moment, let's say, of the, of the integral of this function with, with a test function, then I can write it like that. I have uh, this truncated one and the error. So if I prove that the errors are independent, uh, then I'll, I'm done. Because uh, then in the expectation, if I subtract the, subtract the mean, uh, they would contribute zero. Uh, and then I need to prove that the first term converges to the GFF, okay? So that's the... That's kind of the idea. So you truncate, you prove that uh, the truncated one, which behaves nicely with scaling limits, continuously with the scaling limit, that converges. And then you, uh, okay, so that's the step one. I don't have time to tell you more details. Um, for the universality, we use this very nice result of Yadin Yehudov, which says that uh, central limit theorem actually implies convergence of uh, loop period walk to SLE2. So that's how uh, the SLE2 also becomes universal, okay? Um, Okay, so we proved that this truncated one converges to the GFF. Okay, um, and finally, uh, the, so I have five minutes, yes? No, you have 10 minutes. Ah, you have 10 minutes. Ah, good. 15 minutes of questions. Oh, okay, okay. Okay, good, so I have a bit more time. <laughs> I was thinking I have five minutes, okay. Uh, uh, okay, so let me tell you a bit about this, uh, this part. So I have truncated and I've using, used continuity to somehow prove convergence of the joint moments, okay? But convergence to where? We want to prove it converges to GFF, okay? So this is, this is where we use, uh, so initially we tried to prove it just directly without using anything because convergence of moments actually does imply, uh, because things are normal, you would expect that it would does imply convergence actually uh, in the whole distribution, however, uh, there were some technicalities, but somehow we discovered this uh, new way of looking at it, which is using this imaginary geometry coupling, which somehow simplified, uh, simplified this approach, and, and the identification was, was clear, okay? 
Uh, and we like this, uh, this approach, although it would be nice to prove it in the other way also, just directly, but we don't know how to do it yet. Uh, but using this approach, uh, you can identify the limit, and not only identify the limit, you can find the joint convergence of the tree and the height function together into some sort of a coupled GFF spanning tree, continuum spanning tree pair. So let me explain to you what that means. Okay? So this, this goes into this theory of imaginary geometry. Uh, this, it's just for this identification part. Okay? So that's uh, where we use this theory. So it's a big theory. It's developed by Miller and Sheffield in a series of uh, four papers, which spans over, uh, I don't know, 400 pages. Uh, so, so what's the basic idea? You, you, you have, if you have a, let's say you have a smooth field, okay? And you, you look at um, e to the i times uh, that, that function, maybe times some constant, chi there, okay? So what this means that you have a vector field, a smooth vector field, if it's a smooth function, and when you have this vector field, you can sort of go along the arrows and get these curves, which, is, which they call the flow line. Concretely, they satisfy this differential equation. Um, and you can also play with it a bit, introduce a parameter saying that I will turn in a constant times this angle, not just directly along this angle. So that will give you different sort of curves. Okay. okay. And so the theory of imaginary geometry is all about making sense of this when the function is not a smooth function, but uh, a Gaussian free field. So it's not a function to start with, so it's, it's an open problem to make sense of this. However, the way, the, the language in which it is made sense is, in the, is the following. They prove that uh, the Gaussian free field and, and a bunch of curves, which they call the flow lines, uh, there is a coupling between these, these two sort of, uh, these, two, um, uh, these two families. So these flow lines are, are SLE kappa, are variants of SLE kappa in, in various ways. Um, so, so there is a way in which you can couple these two together such that they, they, they satisfy very nice properties. In particular, uh, you can determine these, uh, these flow lines, which are some variants of SLE kappa, uh, if you know the GFF. So it's a deterministic function. And for example, if you know this tree of flow lines, if you know flow line from every point, you also know the GFF, so it goes the other way around too. So it's really a function of each other, okay? So that's uh, maybe in one line what, what's, the, uh, what's this theory. So what's, uh, what, is, what has this got to do with, uh, with our problem? So here's some nice pictures by Jason Miller of these flow lines. Uh, you can find, him, find these pictures in his web page also. They're very nice. Um, uh, so here's a picture of, uh, of the GFF and the spanning tree, which is, which is what concerns us. So um, the colors, uh, so the dark colors uh, are, are, are larger numbers and the light colors are the smaller numbers. And this green tree is the uniform spanning tree. Um, so what I've uh, simulated here is, the, is that the, the, the winding of the whole uniform spanning tree and I've just sampled a few branches here. Okay. So you can see that you can get the, get the whole field if you know the spanning tree. So it's a function of the spanning tree. But what we prove is that this field is actually square root two times the GFF. Okay. So this is, the, uh, this is exactly the, the coupling which is described also in imaginary geometry. So this, this winding and spanning tree, winding field and spanning tree coupling is exactly what is uh, what's the imaginary geometry coupling also. Okay. So how we prove the uniqueness? Well, uh, in, this, in this theory they say that if you have a flow lines, if you have some, uh, flow, uh, some set of curves which satisfy certain properties with the Gaussian free field, uh, such that the given the flow lines, given a bunch of flow lines, you know the conditional law of the GFF given this, this set of branches, and you know some, some other stuff, then, um, then, the whole, uh, then the whole field has to be the GFF. So, so there's some uniqueness properties of this, uh, of this theory, of, of the field, uh, given the flow lines, that you can exploit somehow. Um, so you have to prove that uh, these properties also hold in our setup for the winding and the spanning tree. Once you do that, uh, uh, using this uniqueness, um, you, can, uh, you can prove that actually this field is the GFF. Okay. Uh, last, ah, okay. So last uh, few minutes, I will try to, try to explain what's the, what's the rest of the proof. So, okay, so we have taken care of the red parts. We have shown the winding of the red parts converges to square root two times the GFF. And the blue parts are, 
we want to prove they're independent, okay? It's, non it's a non-trivial fact. The, the blue parts uh, uh, are actually macroscopic, so in the, in the delta mesh size, there will, there will be a, actually a lot of branches, infinitely many branches. Uh, but this, but it's, it's kind of uh, maybe intuitively clear that they will be independent. I mean, if you know these long branches, and if you know that the blue branches are short, they will sort of quickly attach to these long branches, and it has no effect on what's happening on another faraway point. That's kind of the intuition. Uh, and we do this uh, using some multi-scale argument, okay? And uh, using, uh, and these arguments, the, 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 to the crucial point is, is what is called the, the Schramm's lemma. And this is, the, this is the thing I was telling you about the long red branches and the short blue branches. Um, it says that given any error, um, if you, let's say epsilon, if you know uh, J branches, where J depends only on epsilon, not the mesh size, that's the crucial part, then, uh, uh, then all the branches would be smaller than, smaller than epsilon. Okay, so all the rest of the branches. Maybe I'll show you a video uh, to explain this a bit. Uh, no? It's too hard for me. I have to, I think, to put it on the other screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, okay, thank you. Okay, so I've tried to do Wilson's algorithm on a, on, a, on, a, on a uniform spanning tree, and the red branches are the first 100 branches, and you can see after that the blue branches are pretty short. The red branches were the long ones, and then the blue branches were extremely short. Okay? So what this means is that if you want to know the winding field, if you know the first few red branches and you know the joint law of the winding field of these finitely many red branches, you almost know the field, except for a very small error. Okay? And this very small error is sort of in enclosed in this uh, FET or this epsilon T that was, uh, that was there. Okay, so that's, uh, maybe that's convincing, I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the error part, and uh, this is the part that's, uh, uh, that's a work in progress, so it should be all taken with a pinch of salt. So. So it turns out that uh, this Temperley and bijection sort of um, extends to, uh, to higher genera, if you want. So what, what, does, what happens? You don't have a uniform spanning tree, but some cycle-rooted uh, spanning forests. Okay? So you'll have some cycles. The cycles have to be non-contractible. Okay? And, uh, and still, uh, there is this connection that uh, this height function is, 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 is in some sense the winding of the branches. However, uh, the height function uh, no longer makes sense. As you, as you saw in the torus, if you go along this cycle, uh, it picks up some number which you have to add every time, so it's a multi-valued function. But uh, as a difference, you can still, still make sense of this as a, as, as a function on the edges, let's say. You can still make sense of this. And uh, so what, what happens here is that you don't get the GFF but you get some kind of a, a compactified version of the GFF where there is a topological term which is independent of the, of the GFF on this surface. So you get a, so you can define the GFF, let's say, on a torus. However, the height function won't convert just to that. It, there will be some independent component which is a harmonic one form, which you get, which is basically the, uh, the, uh, the numbers that you get when you go along the non-contractible loops, these extra numbers that you pick up. Okay, so that's, uh, that's open in many topologies and many kind of graphs. So for example, on the torus, uh, for the square lattice, this convergence was proved by Dubeda uh, using uh, Castellan matrix methods, again. Um, um, and for, for general graphs satisfying CLT, they prove the convergence of this topological component. So this is a work of Dubeda and Ghesseri, who proves this convergence of topological components uh, of, this, uh, of this field. So what we think we can do is, uh, for a nice, uh, nice surface, you can probably you can prove that uh, the height field converges. Okay, so if you want to identify the field again, we have to use this imaginary geometry on a general surface which is not known. Okay, however, if you have that, we we think we can uh, we can get the get the limit. 
However, we can still, for example, in the torus, we can get the limit by comparison with, uh, with, this, uh, with, this, uh, with this square lattice. So I really don't have time to go into any detail. However, if you, um, sorry, however, if you uh, compare it with the work of Dubeda, and if you have some kind of universality of the cycle-rooted spanning forest, the scaling limit of the cycle-rooted spanning forest, uh, some, some nice way of, uh, of uh, doing this, uh, doing this uh, Wilson's algorithm, which also extends to this higher genera on this, on this, on this uh, cycle-rooted spanning forest, then you can expect that you can uh, compare it with the square lattice and, and get the convergence uh, to the GFF. So that's what, uh, that's what we're, we're writing at the moment. Okay, so that's, uh, that's what I wanted to I'd maybe advertise a bit. And then uh, more science fiction, which I sort of uh, told you slightly in the beginning of the talk, that what happens if you introduce interactions? That's when you get away from this uh, exact solvability. And then there's a very recent result, which is a fantastic result. It says that if you do this interaction, uh, which is a very, and let's say the interaction is very small, epsilon, um, then you converge to uh, some different, uh, constant times the Gaussian free field. This is a work of uh, Giuliani, Mastro Pietro, and Toninelli, very recent result, okay? So this is a perturbative result, but still it's, uh, we are brave and we want to conjecture the following, uh, that if you have interacting dimers, okay, the spanning tree converge, uh, con connection is, is still true, however, it's now no longer a uniform spanning tree, but some kind of a weird spanning tree which we have no, no control of, okay? There is no domain mark of property and it's, it's weird. Um, so we don't have scaling limit of that tree. However, we believe that if you do take a scaling limit, the imaginary geometry connection still holds true. I mean, the imaginary geometry theory is, is well-defined for any variance of the Gaussian free field, not only square root two, but any, uh, any chi, where chi and uh, kappa, for example, are related by that, by that relation. So once you, have, once you know that, and once you know that the, sort of in the discrete, the, the winding, the connection between the winding and the height function also holds. However, uh, that's, uh, because that's, there's no randomness there, it's a, it's a discrete connection. So if you know that, you can, you can believe that uh, this sort of the whole picture holds true. Uh, maybe proving the, the, far, the, the bottom arrow is, is not so bad. Uh, it's, it's all in the continuum, so that, that, that's still fine. However, proving the left arrow is, uh, is we think is hard, and it's, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't know how to do it. Uh, but the right arrow, people are working on it, and uh, there's, there should be more new and new results on, on, on the rightmost arrow. However, it's still, uh, still uh, very interesting and an open, open area at the moment. Okay, so I will, uh, I will stop at this point. Thank you.